scientist. My name is James and I'm going to be answering some of your questions today. Our first question comes from Jacob. He's in grade two in Ottawa, which is where I'm from as it happens. And Jacob asks, what are plasma and Bose-Einstein condensate? Great questions. So to answer those, let's go back and review some of the basics. Uh, let's think about water as an example. So water comes in three states usually, uh, solid, liquid, or gas. And if you look really closely at a block of ice, for example, you would see that it's made of tiny pieces called molecules. These molecules can pull on one another. And in a solid, the pulling force between the molecules is so strong that they organize themselves into a nice little crystal structure, like this one at the bottom left here. So all of the molecules are tightly packed and organized. If I heat up my ice, by raising its temperature, the molecules are gonna to start to move around. They're gonna to start to move around so much that the pulling forces that keep them organized begin to break down. And in this case, the molecules can sort of slip and slide all over each other. This is a liquid. This is what happens at zero degrees Celsius when you melt ice. So let's say I keep heating my water up, I keep adding more energy the molecules are gonna move around more and more until they start to break free from my liquid. So if I boil a pot of water on the stove and I see steam coming off, that steam is all of the water molecules escaping those pulling forces that hold the water together. So how does that get us to a plasma? Here's another cartoon. This one shows the same story, the solid with all of the particles nicely organized, pulling tightly together the liquid with the molecules moving around, sliding over each other, and our gas with the molecules flying out in every direction. In order to understand a plasma, we have to think a little more about what the molecules are made of. So if I look at a molecule, it's made of atoms, and those atoms are made of a positive core that we call a nucleus, and a bunch of negatively charged tiny pieces called electrons. If I heat up, my atoms to a high enough temperature, I eventually get them so energetic that the electrons begin to break free of the pulling force that holds them onto the nucleus in the exact same way that the molecules break free from the water when I boil it. In this case, I get a charged gas. This gas is what we call a plasma. And it has a lot of really interesting features. One of them is that it can carry a current. So for example, if I have a box of plasma and I plug a battery into it, I can actually run an electric current through the plasma because of all these free charges that are moving around. So that's our plasma state of matter. To understand a Bose-Einstein condensate, we have to go to the totally opposite end of the spectrum of temperature. But before we do that, let's think about two types of matter. Imagine I give you a cardboard box and then I ask you to fill the box up with tennis balls. Eventually, you're gonna to get to the point where the box is full because the tennis balls stack on top of each other. When a particle behaves like a tennis ball, when it stacks on top of the other particles, we call it a fermion. If I give you the same cardboard box and now ask you to fill the box up with light, imagine taking flashlights and torches and sunlight, whatever you want, you try to fill the box up with light you're never really going to get the box full. There's always gonna be room to add more light to the box. And that's because light doesn't stack up like the tennis balls do. Light kind of all smushes together at the bottom of the box. It kind of piles into one place. If a particle behaves like light, we call it a boson. So let's imagine what would happen if I started out with a gas of bosons, okay? If I have a gas of bosons, all of them are moving around, they're moving in different directions, and I start to cool them down. As I cool the bosons down, those pulling forces that we talked about with the water molecules, not quite exactly the same type of pulling forces, but the same sort of idea, pull all of my bosons together in the same place. But because the bosons are not like tennis balls, 
they can pile into the same small region of space at the same time, kind of like ghosts. They can stack inside of one another. So here's a picture of a Bose-Einstein condensate being formed. This picture on the leftmost is our gas at a high temperature. All of the bosons are kind of spread out and smushed out. And as I lower the temperature more and more, the bosons begin to pile into this kind of shark fin shape. So that's a Bose-Einstein condensate, a state of matter that occurs at very low temperature that globs up together, the exact opposite in some sense of a plasma. Great question. Okay, so Amelia, Ilian, and Leandro all ask, how do things stick to magnets? How do magnets stick to each other? Another awesome uh, set of questions. And to understand this one, we need to learn a little bit more about those electrons, right? So remember the electrons are the negative charges outside of a nucleus. In addition to being negatively charged, all of those electrons carry a small bar magnet with them. So think of a, a fridge magnet on your fridge, right? All of the electrons are carrying around one of these little magnets with a north pole and a south pole. In most materials that we encounter, those little bar magnets are pointing every which way. So take a block of ice, right? A block of ice doesn't stick to your fridge. A block of ice isn't magnetic. If you look really closely at your block of ice and you look at the electrons inside, you would see that the bar magnets they're carrying are pointing in any direction. But in certain special materials, when you lower the temperature enough, the bar magnets all align together. And the reason they do this is actually kind of complicated, but you can understand it in terms of that negative charge. So remember that negative charges repel negative charges. Inside of a solid where everything is close together, the electrons are uncomfortable. They don't like being close to each other. And so they try to arrange themselves in such a way that they can be as far apart as they can. When they do this, all of their little bar magnets line up together and you get something that we call a ferromagnet. So ferromagnetism is a fridge magnet. But what about these other materials? What about things like a coin? You know, So sometimes you can have a coin that doesn't stick to your fridge, but it will stick to a magnet. Well, in those materials, the bar magnets aren't organized, but they are able to move around. And so if you introduce a magnetic field, say I take my fridge magnet and I try to hold it to a paperclip, all of the little bar magnets in the paperclip will snap together and try to follow along the magnetic field from the outside magnet that I've brought in. And that phenomenon is called paramagnetism. So ferromagnetism is our fridge magnets, stuff that push magnetic fields out into the world, and paramagnetism is when a material like a paperclip is able to respond to a magnetic field and try to align and snap to it. And when that happens, a, an object like a paperclip or a, uh, maybe a quarter or something can stick to a magnet. Okay, so that's a great question. There's one last case, that's diamagnetism. That's the word we use for things that don't stick to magnets. So you think about a piece of wood or plastic, Wood and plastic don't like magnetic fields. They don't try to align. The electrons inside of those materials couldn't care less about the magnetic field that you're applying. Okay, awesome question. Okay, so uh, Kai Ning asks, can you find magnets in nature? And the answer to that is absolutely. So the first magnets that we have in writing come from about 600 BC, uh, and they were discovered by the Greeks. but all over the world, people discovered magnetism. One way to make a magnet in nature is to take uh, lightning and to add it to the mineral magnetite. So magnetite is a rock. You can find it inside of a, a cave or a mine. And it's composed of iron and oxygen. And if a lightning strike occurs near magnetite, all of the electrons in the magnetite, remember that they're all pointing any direction they like, right? When the lightning comes down, it produces a strong magnetic field that causes all of those electrons to align, to snap together, kind of like in the paramagnetic case. The difference is that once the electrons snap together in a material like magnetite, they stay snapped together. And you get what's called lodestone. So in the ancient world, people discovered that these rocks, these lodestones, could attract things like iron nails. And that was the earliest discovery of magnetism that I'm aware of. So yes, magnets can occur in nature. 
and in some pretty cool ways. Okay, so Lauren asks, what is a superconductor? So to understand superconductivity, let's just remember how electrical conductivity works in general. So here I have a wire on the left-hand side, maybe a, a cable that I plug into the back of my computer. And so that I don't shock myself, that cable is gonna be covered in a piece of rubber, an insulator. Inside of an insulator, the electrical charges are all stuck to the atoms that they came with. So when I cool my substance down, I make it into a solid, all of the electrons are held tightly together, they can't move around, and so I can't conduct electricity. But inside of my insulator, maybe I have a copper wire. If you look closely at a copper wire under a really strong microscope, you would see that it's arranged into sort of like highways for charge. And those highways for charge allow the electrons in the, in the copper to respond to, say, a battery or an electric field. And so that's why we have conductors. So what's a superconductor? Well, even inside of copper where you have these nice highways for the charge to move along, you might have impurities. You know, maybe your copper isn't 100% pure. Maybe there's a piece of nickel in there or something that jams up the highway and makes it hard for the electrons to flow freely. In a superconductor, that's not a problem. If you cool a superconductor to a low enough temperature, the electrons can move without any resistance at all. Superconductors have one other property, which is pretty interesting. They are perfect diamagnets. So remember before we said that a paramagnet likes magnetic fields. If you apply a magnetic field to a paramagnet, it'll respond by sucking onto the magnet. A diamagnet hates magnetic fields, and a superconductor really hates magnetic fields. So you can see here on the right a picture of a superconductor levitating above a magnet. The important thing to remember here is that the superconductor isn't itself magnetic. It's just trying to push out the magnetic field coming from the magnet below it. So this picture on the right is actually an example of real levitation, not science fiction. Very cool. So some people think that superconductors might be useful for things like uh, high-speed rail lines. Uh, and actually, we use them all the time in uh, medical imaging devices because those devices require strong electrical currents uh, in order to image people's brains, for example. So superconductors, very useful, pretty super. Okay, Joanna asks, when making tea, will putting milk in before or after the boiling of water affect the temperature differently? So the answer is actually no. And in order to understand why, we have to think about how heat moves around, okay? So in this cartoon, block A has a higher temperature than block B. I put them both together, and after I wait for long enough, the two blocks will come into what we call equilibrium. Equilibrium is just a way of saying they have the same temperature. So imagine your tea in your cup, and you've got your milk, and you've got your hot tea. No matter which one I add first, they always have to come to the same equilibrium. The total energy between the milk and the tea is the same no matter what order I add them in. So it doesn't matter for the temperature. Some people say it matters for the flavor. I don't know if that's true. I would encourage you to try both and see if you can tell the difference. Jamie asks, why do people say you shouldn't wear black clothes in summer if you want to stay cool? So what we have to think about here is where do colors come from? Colors come from when light hits, a, hits an object and is reflected off. So for example, if I go out and I look at uh, a leaf, light from the sun hits the leaf and only the green light gets reflected off into my eye. The other colors of light that are contained in the sunlight get absorbed. If something hits an object and everything gets absorbed, it's black, right? Black is the absence of color being reflected back at you. By contrast, white is all the colors together. So if you wear something black in the summertime, all of the sunlight that hits your t-shirt is gonna get absorbed by it and heat it up, and you're gonna be pretty uncomfortable. So that's why you wanna to stick to wearing light clothing in hot weather. Okay, great question. So Carlos asks, why is a perpetual motion machine not possible? And will it ever be possible? 
So a perpetual motion machine, for those who haven't heard of them, are machines that are supposed to move forever. So you start the machine moving at one point in time, and until the end of the universe, the machine just keeps going. And all throughout history, people have tried to design these machines. So here you know, are a few examples of it. They all have these kind of funny looking hammers on them that try to keep them moving and try to stop them from slowing down. Unfortunately, none of these are possible. So there's a great law in physics called the second law of thermodynamics. And basically what this law says in the context of perpetual motion machines is that any physical system, doesn't matter what it is, will always dissipate energy into the environment. In other words, no machine can perfectly conserve energy forever. Even the planets orbiting the sun will eventually lose their orbital energy. But that'll happen so far down the road that the sun won't even be here. So we don't have to worry about it. So the second law of thermodynamics stops us from having perpetual motion machines. And unless the second law of thermodynamics is disproven, uh, we will never be able to have them. And that does not look like a very likely uh, possibility. So Libby asks, why can't we figure out a way to recycle carbon dioxide into energy when it's released from fossil fuels? That's a really awesome question. And in fact, on Earth, there is already a whole collection of species that have figured out how to do this, right? Plants take energy from the sun, they take oxygen from the air, they take uh, minerals and sugar, and they mix those with carbon dioxide to produce energy and, and to build their structure up, right? So why can't we do this to produce energy here on Earth? The problem with photosynthesis is that it is really inefficient. You get about a 1% conversion of energy to be stored in the sugars that are produced as a byproduct of, of photosynthesis. So even though it seems like a really great way to get rid of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and produce energy, because it's so inefficient, it would be more trouble than it's worth. However, to solve the problem of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, people are working on carbon capture technology. So this technology doesn't produce energy. It actually requires energy as an input, but it can suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to help reduce greenhouse gases. So maybe not for energy, but certainly absorbing carbon dioxide for environmental reasons is possible. Okay, so Teresa asks, why is nuclear energy so dangerous? Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say here is that nuclear energy does not have to be dangerous, but it certainly can be extremely dangerous. And to understand why, we have to think a little bit about how nuclear energy gets made. So inside of a nuclear reactor, those, those cores of atoms that we talked about when we were learning about plasma get hit by a particle called a neutron, and they break apart into two smaller atoms that have more energy than the initial atom did. And that excess energy is used to produce heat, which boils water that turns a steam turbine. So what's so dangerous about it? Well, there are two things that we have to think about. The first thing is that when we hit an atom with a neutron and break it apart into smaller pieces, it often releases either an electron or a helium nucleus. And these electrons or helium nuclei are really energetic. And if they hit your body, they can damage your DNA and cause all kinds of nasty side effects. This is what we call radiation. There are actually three kinds of radiation that we have to worry about. The first one, those helium nucleus nuclei that we talked about, those are called alpha particles. The free electrons moving around are called beta particles. And then we can also get really high energy light that people call gamma rays or uh, gamma photons. So these three types of radiation can all harm you, but fortunately we can block them. So if you go into a real nuclear reactor, they're going to have concrete and lead lined walls to keep all of that radiation contained. But radiation isn't the only danger from nuclear energy. We also have a risk of nuclear meltdown. So if I have this chemical reaction occurring, a neutron comes in, it splits one atom, that atom shoots out a new neutron, it splits another atom. What happens if we lose control of the reaction? What happens if we start splitting more atoms and producing more energy than we can safely use, right? So that event is called a meltdown. 
and it's what happened in Fukushima and Chernobyl, and it's really scary. Fortunately, we have technology to stop meltdowns from occurring. So one technology is to use what's called a control rod. You can take a metal called cadmium, and you can put it inside of your nuclear reactor, and it will gobble up all those neutrons that are flying around. Remember, the neutrons are the things that actually break the atoms apart. And so if I eat up all the neutrons, then there's no way for the reaction to keep going, and I can safely stop my meltdown from happening. So I think it's important to remember that as long as we design reactors with the correct safety procedures and in places that are not at risk of being hit by natural disaster, nuclear energy can be very safe. But it's important to remember the uh, risks involved as well. So yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so Jacob asks, how long until we run out of non-renewable energy in the world? So this is a tricky question to answer because it's hard to estimate how much non-renewable energy is already on the planet. There's a study from Stanford University, uh, and the link down here, uh, the link is down here at the bottom. So if anyone wants to go and uh, learn a bit more about the assumptions and methods of this uh, particular study, they can follow that link and, uh, and uh, learn a bit more about it. Uh, and in that study, they produced this plot, which estimates how long we have until we run out of coal, gas, and oil. And so you can see on this figure that by the end of this century, we might be looking at a situation where we're running out of non-renewable resources. So that's really extra motivation to invest in things like solar and wind power, and indeed, maybe even nuclear energy. Uh, so yeah, very important, uh, very important question. Okay, and finally we have Samantha, and Samantha asks, how do you calculate how much dark energy there is? So for anyone watching who doesn't know, in the early 20th century, this guy Hubble looks through his telescope, and he discovers that no matter where he looks in the night sky, the other galaxies in, in the universe are moving away from us. So the universe is expanding. Now, the naive expectation would be that gravity, which pulls things together, is trying to slow that expansion down. But when you check, it turns out that the expansion of the universe is actually getting faster as time goes on. So here's a fun little cartoon. It kind of maps out the history of the universe. You've got your Big Bang, a period of rapid inflation, and then you get up to today, where we're in this expanding universe with galaxies and planets and stars and so on. If you look at a distant star, you can see how fast it's receding if you can predict how bright it is. So we call these things standard candles. Uh, in particular, we use supernova. So when a star explodes, we can basically understand how bright that would be if it was right next to us. And so when we look up at the night sky, based on how dim it is, we can figure out how far away it is. And we can use that to measure how fast the universe is expanding. That's one technique that we might use. There are actually many techniques that are required together to get a good estimate for how much dark energy there is in the universe. But dark energy is just the catch-all term for this energy that is causing the accelerated expansion. So uh, right now we have this Lambda CDM model. It's a model that uses a bunch of these techniques together to estimate the amount of dark energy. Uh, and, and, uh, and yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's basically how it's done. Uh, I should confess that that's not my research area, but uh, I would encourage you to look into that a little bit more. All right, so that brings us to the end of uh, our questions. Uh, thanks everyone for submitting. All the questions were fantastic, and uh, I hope everyone can join again for the next Ask a Scientist. Thank you.